Hello, my name is April Hewlett and I'm with the University of Idaho and today we're going to talk about invasive plants and weeds. I want to start by talking about origin and when we think about the word origin, we're referring to areas where plants have evolved. For example, we say we have native plants and we have introduced plants. Native plants are typically have originated in North America. Introduced plants are um, plants that were intentionally or accidentally brought to North America. Within these two categories, we also have invasive species and noxious weeds that we'll be talking about today. Invasive species are based on different plant characteristics that makes them invasive. Noxious weeds are weeds that have been specifically identified as noxious by the law. All organisms have a home where they've existed and evolved for thousands of years. A native or indigenous species is one that occurs in a plant community without the help of humans. This is not always easy to determine, but one of the factors we often consider. Species native to North America are generally those that occurred prior to European settlement. So the question is then, how long have they been here? An organism's home is also determined by a host of influences. Native plants are well adapted to local climate patterns, soils, animals, and microbes. Introduced plants are plants or organisms that have been introduced by humans to an area outside of its natural home range. Introduced plants are often called other names such as non-native, exotic, alien, foreign, non-indigenous. All of these things refer to introduced species. And this designation applies to species that were introduced from other continents, but also other ecosystems or even another habitat within the ecosystem. Since the discovery of America in the 15th century, people have played a very significant role in moving plants, animals, diseases, and other organisms around the world to places far beyond their native home range. Right now, it's estimated that there's approximately 3,500 species of plants that have escaped cultivation and become established and naturalized in native ecosystems. So think for a minute, how did and how are humans introducing non-native plants? Some of the ways could be through grains and food crops, seeds in ships, ornamentals, plants for erosion control. Historically, we brought plants over from Eurasia that established quickly so we could reduce erosion. Plants with high forage value have been introduced, and we always can introduce them accidentally. Introduction of exotic plants continue today and it's increasing due to the large and ever expanding human population. Many of these species, native or introduced, can exist harmoniously in many different ecosystems. However, how native and introduced species respond to new environmental conditions influences whether we consider them to be invasive species. Invasive species are those that establish and spread over large areas and persist. Persistent invasive species often displace our native species. Here I have two examples of a non-native and a native plant. So we have cheatgrass or downy broom, which is a non-native introduced annual. This annual grass can easily invade after disturbance and use resources, making it difficult for our native plant species to reestablish. The other native plant is a juniper tree, and this is a native tree that due to fire suppression has started to encroach on sagebrush step ecosystems. And when we say encroach, it means that it's coming in and it's displacing native plant species, particularly sagebrush and perennial grasses, and making it difficult for them to stay established in their ecosystems. Think for a moment about some of the growth characteristics that you think invasive species have that allows them to dominate an ecosystem. Some of the characteristics include that they're abundant seed producers. Russian thistle, which is an invasive species, can produce over 200,000 seeds per plant. They also have a long-term survival of seeds. Leafy spurge, for example, can have a viable seed for up to eight years. 
sagebrush, a species that we actually want, you, it typically has a viable seed for one to two years, if we're lucky. Invasive species have rapid po population establishment. They're often pioneer species after disturbance, meaning that they come in and they're first to occupy a disturbed site. This gives them a competitive advantage. Cheatgrass, a winter annual, can use the resources more quickly in the spring than our native species, making them more competitive. Invasive species also lack natural enemies. These can include things like insects or microbes or even animals that control populations in their native environments. In natural resources, we often hear weeds and noxious weeds, and we need to understand the difference in these two terms. So what is a weed? A weed is a plant of little value or any plant that's really out of place. It often competes with crops and native plants and it can affect um, the health and the productivity of native landscapes. It's kind of interesting to read different definitions that describe weeds. Here's one from the Applied Weed Science Society. And here's one from Ralph Waldo Emerson, which I really like. A weed is a plant whose virtues have not yet been discovered. So sometimes when we're dealing with weeds, maybe we just haven't discovered all the virtues. What is a noxious weed then? The real difference between weeds and noxious weeds are that noxious weeds are designated by law. It typically has economic damage and it's a threat to human interests. Noxious weeds do not encompass all of invasive plant species or other weeds. For example, in Idaho, there are hundreds of weed species. However, there are only 67 that are designated noxious by the Idaho law. In comparison, there's 47 noxious weeds in Nevada and there's 27 noxious weeds in Utah. So I'd like you to take a few minutes and watch War of the Weeds. This was a video that was done by Outdoor Idaho and it's really well done and it talks about some of the plant species that you have to memorize for this class that are noxious weeds. And it also just makes some really interesting points and discusses the difficulties that we have with noxious weeds and natural resources. So it's definitely worth your time and there most likely will be a question from the video on the next exam. So hopefully after you watch the video by Outdoor Idaho, you have some idea of how weeds can impact rangelands. We'll briefly discuss a few here. One, they reduce biological diversity. That means not just in plants do we lose diversity, but we also lose insect and wildlife due to these big monocultures that they create. Monocultures meaning one species. They can alter the hydrologic conditions or alter soil characteristics. And we'll talk about that when we talk about salt cedar in a minute, which is one of the plants you need to memorize for this class. They can alter fire intensity and frequency. We always talk about the cheatgrass wildfire cycle in natural resources, especially here in the West. Basically, cheatgrass comes in, it dries quickly and makes our rangelands very flammable. A fire occurs, and what's the species that comes back after fire? Cheatgrass. Cheatgrass again dries out, and so we are in this wildfire cycle that is shorter than it typically was. They interfere with natural succession. They compete for native pollinators, and they can displace rare plant species. All of these things negatively impact rangelands. Okay, Dr. Hewlett did a great job of telling you the overview of invasive and noxious weeds. And now I'm going to just d describe a few plants for you. This is Karen, and I'm going to take over and describe uh, five plants that will help you understand these concepts that were introduced and things that you need to know in this class. So one grass, a couple forbs, and a couple woody plants. The first one is one that's probably familiar. We talk a lot about cheatgrass. It's also called downy brome. It's an annual introduced plant. And one of the most destructive things about it is it forms a really great fuel bed. So in this picture here, you'll see that yellow color. And that uh, is when the, the cheatgrass gets really dried out. It forms this really kind of uniform uh, 
bed underneath the sagebrush and it becomes a really good fuel. So Dr. Hewlett talked about that and that's the most challenging thing about cheatgrass. It's an annual plant so that means it's really able to expand out and grow out into the the areas between the shrubs. It's a small bunch grass. You'll see here on the right it has a pretty weak root. That's a characteristic of all annual plants. When it's old it gets yellow like that and it expands between shrubs. When it's young on the right hand side it's green and the leaf blades and sheaths and glooms are all kind of hairy. So when it's green it's actually fairly good forage and then it turns into this fuel when it dries out. Let's take a closer look at that seed head. The seed head is a panicle and it's got really weak panicle branches. So the, the spikelets when they hang on them because those panicle branches are weak the plant always looks like it's kind of just in disarray or the, the uh, spikelets are just kind of hanging down. Um, when you take a closer look at the spikelets, this plant has really obvious awns. That term scabrous means that they are um, uh, stiff, stiff and kind of uh, rough. So the florets are, um, have a lemma and then they have an awn and the awn is almost as long as the seed or that lemma part. When the plants are young, they're very green and hairy and then on the left here you'll see they grow purple or red. So that when the turn plant turns purple, that's when it goes from being a fairly decent forage to being a really bad fuel for fires. So look for that disarray of the panicle seed head and those awns. Now let's turn to a perennial plant that is quite a problem. This is leafy spurge. It's an introduced perennial. And uh, you'll see first that it has these yellow bracts. That's the most obvious thing about the plant. It has these yellow heart sheeped They're actually leaves. Although they look like flowers, they're actually leaves at the base of the flower. The flower is just that, uh, the seed is just that little um, sphere that you see in the middle there. It's a very nondescript flower, but those um, bracts really make it a showy. Uh, plants. So you can see that yellow from quite a distance. It has dark roots that can grow way deep into the soil. They have pink buds. You can't see that here, but the little nodes on that root are little pink buds that can form new plants if you cut off the top. So that's one of the problems. If you cut it off, you mow off this plant, all of those buds will be activated and then they'll just send up a whole bunch of new plants. It also has a milky resin that doesn't help you really identify it in the uh, on a, um, a picture but if you're out in the field and you break a stem you'll see a milky sap come out of it this plant is a euphorb it's in the euphorbiaceae family and all members of that euphorb have that milky sap um, and that's bad for some animals like cows really don't like it humans should avoid it it's said that if you get that milky sap in a cut it could form it could cause a cancerous growth However, sheep and goats like it a lot, and so sheep and goats can be used to uh, manage this plant, and that milky resin actually has quite a few um, energy compounds in it, so it's actually quite energetic. It gives them quite a bit of energy. So in the field, look for that yellow uh, bracts, so you can see that when you're driving along, or you can see it in a picture. The leaves are just long and linear and the flowers are all at the top. They don't go all the way down the stem. They're at the top. And, and in this picture on the right, you can kind of see that red, that red um, uh, root as it kind of goes into the soil. Another noxious weed we have in Idaho is spotted knapweed. It's not just Idaho. Across the whole West, we have problems with spotted knapweed. All of the knapweeds have either a white or purple flower. And this one has a very beautiful purple flower. And right underneath that purple, you'll see it kind of spotted. That's why it's called spotted knapweed. It has a composite seed head. So each of those little um, cups that this, the flowers are in, that's the composite. Those are bracts. And then those flowers are actually disc flowers. The leaves are um, mostly just kind of really deeply lobed. They're kind of hairy, but they're, you can just see, if you look at the outline, it just looks like fingers almost. They're really deeply lobed. Here's a closer look at those spots, the bracts that hold that composite flower. They just get dark towards the tips and they give the plant just kind of a spotted look. Uh, that middle picture, you can see it just kind of spreads out. It has rhizomes and so it will just kind of spread out over the soil. And again, just like leafy spurge, if you cut off the top, it will just send a few new uh, roots, a few new stems out from buds that are in the roots. And on the right hand side, you can see that the main characteristics, purple ray flowers, spots on the bracts underneath those flowers, and then those highly deeply lobed leaves. So those three characters will help you identify this plant.
A plant that we will talk about when we get to ecology is this one, salt cedar. Salt cedar is perennial, of course, because it's a shrub and it's introduced and it is a noxious weed. It's interesting that this plant was brought to the U.S. because of its ornamental value. On the right hand side, you can see those rather pretty flowers. And uh, as, as um, little villages and farms started to um, you know, come up across the West, somebody remembered this from their homeland and brought this what was considered a beautiful shrub that could be used in around a house to give it some protection and some beautiful flowers. And it's very hardy. It doesn't take much water. But of course, it escaped from those farmlands and it got into the streams of the West. And now it just is, is just forming near monocultures upstreams. So this was a plant that was introduced ornamentally and now is really taking over. It has a real feathery leaf. It's kind of blue green forage and or foliage and you can see that from if you look from a distance you can't really see the leaves they're just these little feathery scales that's why it gets that name salt cedar because if you take a close look at the leaf it looks like a juniper or a cedar tree here's a closer look at those leaves that feathery look of leaves it has red stems and it has those white pink flowers and on the left you might be able to see a little bit of salt kind of shininess on those stems and leaves so that's the problem with salt cedar it take, has really deep roots it goes way down into the soil it pulls up salt and then it puts them on those leaves and then when the leaves fall down it they do fall out down in the fall it's deciduous and they fall onto the ground and then that salt is right there on the soil surface so when you're working in sage in the salt cedar and i've done this you walk through salt cedar all day and you're just you're just a salt lick you're just covered with salt and all that salt falls down onto the soil and the problem with salt is very few plants can tolerate high concentrations of salt so it really just creates um, an area with no vegetation underneath because the salt that rains down from that salt cedar plant really makes it inhospitable for other plants and animals so it's uh, one plant that it's really hard to have anim that animals really can't eat because of the high salt and we can't use targeted grazing to control it either. There are some insects that we'll talk about in class for biocontrol that are becoming available for this plant. The last plant we'll talk about is juniper. Now juniper is different because it's native. It's perennial because it's a woody plant, but it's native. So why is native plant invasive? Well, well many native plants are kept in check by some character by some force of nature and then if that changes they become invasive and that's the case of this plant juniper is native and it, it often occurred like for example throughout the um, intermountain range uh, like the Oahis or the blue mountains it would be at the base of those mountains and it would be kept just in the rockier parts the parts where fire didn't go up into the to the forest so in the areas where it was just not a lot of vegetation then you would see juniper because it is killed by fire this juniper is anyways this western juniper and um and then the fire would go up and it would stop and the juniper would persist so every time it would start to move down into the lowlands a fire would come along and it would take out those young saplings and the, the larger trees would stay up in the rockier higher areas where fire wasn't as as normal i, I will admit that western juniper is really affected by fire other shrubs other juniper trees um, fire can sow it down, but it will resprout and come back after fire. But for most of us, uh, kind of in this northwestern part, the junipers that we have are killed by fire. The leaves are just um, long lines of overlapping scales. So you probably know what a juniper tree looks like. Just look for those kind of fingers of overlapping scales. I'll take a look at the berries and they're real blue. They can actually be used by wildlife. Uh, uh, birds will eat them. And they have you'll see those leaves and um, uh, berries on the right on the top right there kind of have a, a white sheen on them they look like they were painted with white or something white kind of sparkled on them that's a terpene that's a, an essential oil and that's what gives juniper that juniper smell and uh, it, it just it just exudes out on the leaves and it makes it unpalatable because uh, um, those compounds are not they're detrimental to animals they're not necessarily deadly toxic but they they make the animal ill and animals don't then want to eat it so look for blue um blue seeds overlapping scales and sometimes you can see those white nods of the essential oils or the terpenes on the left hand side you'll see uh, some young junipers just marching out onto the sagebrush step and that is bad because it really changes <clears throat> the wildlife habitat it's evergreen
and not and so which means it's not deciduous which means there's some forage value in the winter with those berries and the green leaves but it encroaches out into the rangelands and um, it does make important habitat for wildlife but it also changes the habitat and makes it worse for other animals like sage grouse so those are just a few plants maybe to uh, bring home some of those points about why invasive plants and weeds are detrimental to rangelands